Hi guys, today's video is going to be a landscape photography crash course. So without further ado, let's get into it. Come on then. Whatever your reason for getting into landscape photography, I'm going to tell you something straight from the start. It's an incredible fun hobby. You know, it happens to be my job, but I still love it. I still class it as a hobby. You know, and if you're just doing landscape photography to better yourself as a photographer, or if you just want to learn a new hobby, or if you just want to be outdoors in scenery like this, you know, I can't really think of much better ways to spend a day. And the beauty is it doesn't actually have to be that expensive. So in this video, I'm just going to talk you through the basics and all I'm going to use is your camera and one of these, which is the humble tripod. But before you can use a tripod, you've got to use these things first of all, which are your legs, obviously. And have a scout around find the perfect viewpoint. Right, first of all let's talk about tripods. So why is a tripod so important for landscape photography? Well I'll let you to a secret. Nowadays it's not necessary to keep the camera stable even though obviously it does do that. But modern technology means that a lot of cameras have inbuilt image stabilisation or optical stabilisation in the lens. And that means you can get away with a lot more than used in the day film. But what it does do is it slows down the picture taking process. So we can literally set up the tripod and put the camera in place and then you can fine tune the composition. But before we go that far, what sort of tripod should you get if you haven't got one? Well, all I'm going to say is try and get a fairly heavy one. Not so ridiculously heavy that you can't carry it and don't want to take it anywhere, but also not so light that you end up literally chucking it away, as you may have seen me do in a previous video. This one's a carbon fibre one, you don't have to spend that much money and I would recommend actually trying to get a second hand one. If you're a bit dubious at the moment, you know, if you're just starting out, there's lots of second hand tripods around and you'll, you'll get a good buy. The good thing about using a tripod is once you set it up, you're sort of committing yourself to a scene and that's why I said you should use your legs first of all. Now that you've got your tripod in place, it's a good idea to remove anything off your camera that can flap around, such as straps. Now I quite like this strap because I can actually take the strap part off and just wrap the rest around the centre column. And it's, it's just out of the way and then if you don't, what will happen is the wind will catch hold of this and it'll just shake the camera and sort of defeats the object. Now as we're using the tripod, there's a few things we need to actually do to the camera. First of all, is make sure that image stabilisation is turned off. Next, you want to make sure it's on a self timer. I've set this one up for two seconds, so again, adjust that. Let's set for two seconds. And finally, you want to adjust your ISO. Now, you want to set your ISO to the base level. Now, normally, out of the box as such, your camera will be on auto ISO. Now, your camera doesn't know it's fitted to a tripod, so what it will try to do is it will try and give you a fast enough shutter speed compensate for any sort of camera shake from you holding it. But of course you're on a tripod so you don't need to worry about that. So what we'll do, I'm going to set this down to the base ISO which is ISO 100 on this and that means we get the maximum quality and the best colours we can possibly get. And then it's a case of just fine tuning your composition before delving into the camera settings. Okay so I've moved my position slightly, um, I've just come back a little bit I've only got a 28mm lens on this, so it was a little bit tight, so I had to come back slightly. Okay, going back into the camera settings, we set it on a two second self timer, simply being that when I press the button, I don't want to cause any camera shake. So by doing it this way, it will take the shot, and I haven't had any sort of physical contact with the camera. So going into settings, we've got ISO set at base level. And now we're going to go into aperture priority. Now what we need, we need a fairly high aperture to keep everything in focus. Now an easy way to remember aperture priority is first of all your aperture controls your depth of field and the higher the F number, because that's how the aperture is actually measured, the higher the F number the more in focus and the lower the F number the less in focus. Now generally for landscapes you're going to want more in focus. So for this one I'm probably going to be at F12, F14 because I want the whole caboogle in focus. So I'm just going to do that. So I've set it at 14 and now I'm going to focus on the rocks. It's pretty 
pretty much in the middle. And that should give me adequate depth of field from front to back. You know, I could record a whole video talking about where to exactly focus, but as a rough guide, if you're a third to central point within the frame and you're at a fairly high F number, pretty much everything is going to be in focus and you'll, you'll be good to go. And then really, it's a case of waiting for the light because it's, it's really all about the light. Landscape photography is about the light and it's what makes a photo or breaks a photo. And sometimes you have to keep returning to a location time after time after time. If you've watched some of my older videos, you'll notice I've been here before. I'm yet to get a photo I'm pleased with. I'm not sure if today's going to be the day, to be honest. Uh, I'd like some clothes. Let's see what happens, but we'll have a wait and see. Okay, so I've recomposed slightly. Um, this is the beauty of using a tripod, to be honest. Find your initial spot, and then if you need to move, you generally don't have to move very far, but you can just move the whole lot. And then you can put it down and you, you can look at the scene and you can see what's missing. You know, what do you want to get in? What story do you want to tell your photographs? Because that's what you do with a photo. So I wanted to get a little bit more in and I wanted to get more of the whole rock formation. So I've come slightly around, you know, and we're only talking two or three meters difference, but it's, it's enough to really transform it. And again, it's just a question of waiting for the light. Now you'll notice I'm using the live view. And that's it because it's really convenient, you know, I can see what's going on. And I'm, I'm a lot happier with the composition. You know, I need, I need the light, I need the light to be golden, but you know, for the sake of this photo, I'm quite pleased, you know, it's, it's a nice photo, it's okay. But is it too bright or too dark? Is it underexposed or overexposed? How do you know? You know, is it guesswork? Do you look at a photo and think, oh, that's too bright, that's too dark? Or is there any means you can actually tell on the camera? Well, you're pleased to know there is, and it's called a histogram. Now, I have done a video about histograms, and I will link to it. But basically, what you normally do is press play. So you look at the last image you've taken. Then you press info or display, depending on what your camera is. And you should get a little box appear. And what it effectively is, is a histogram. So it's a graphical representation of the darks and the lights in your shot. And what you don't want is you don't want it all grouped down to the left hand side because that means it's underexposed. And you don't want it all grouped to the right hand side because that means it's overexposed. So you want a nice even distribution from left to right. And if it's too dark, what you do is use exposure compensation, which on the Sony is just a little, a little dial here, which is dead simple. And you have to move it up or down, and you take another shot. You check the histogram again, and you adjust it until you're happy. And really, it's that simple. Now, one last thing to keep in mind when you're reviewing your photos and you've got the histogram on, if anything starts flashing on the screen in the actual photo, uh, normally it could be a red flash, could be a blue flash. If it's red flash, it normally means it's overexposed. This depends on your camera manufacturer. If it's a blue flash, it could mean it's underexposed. And there are patches, basically, where there's no information recorded. Now, if your camera shooting RAW only, you have a little bit of leeway. But if your camera shooting JPEG only, you have no leeway. Really, as a rule of thumb, try to make sure nothing is flashing at all. And that, and that might sound stupid, but if you do that, it's you, you're going to be safe. And I'm just going to quickly go into the subject of RAW and JPEGs because, again, that's probably scope for a total of a video. I would recommend at this stage set your camera to RAW and JPEG. It, yes, it will take up more card space, but what it means, it means you can look at the JPEGs, but you'll also have the RAW files that you can work on at a later date. And just in case you're not sure what RAW file is, a RAW file is actually just, as the name implies, the RAW data from the camera, which then you use a special piece of software to actually process it as such to the look that you want to have. A lot of people starting out with landscape photography just go for straight for JPEGs and you know that, that's fine but you just need to be really careful about your exposure because you will lose information far more easily and you will still lose information with RAW files so always check your histogram always try and make sure nothing's flashing if in doubt slightly underexposed as opposed to overexposing because if you're overexposed you lose detail if you're underexposed, you can generally bring some back, bring your shadows back. But apart from that, 
you're pretty much good to go, you know. I said this was going to be a crash course, and it is a crash course. It's, it's not in depth. This is the pure basics for you to go out, start using your camera, and to come back with some results you like. But by far the most important thing to do is explore, is to get out, walk around, get to know your camera, just practice, just play, just enjoy yourself, because that's what it's about. I'm going to hang around now for a few hours probably, see what the light does, hope some cloud comes, you know. I will put my final shot up now, and if you've enjoyed this video, please do consider subscribing to the channel, please give it a thumbs up, drop a comment, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask, I'll try to answer them all. And hopefully, I'll see you in another video very soon. Until then, thanks a lot for watching, and bye.